Ted, do you? That's fine. Okay. Um, do you want to intro the keynotes, or do you want me to do that? So for like, I can do it. you want to do it? If you leave it up there. Yeah, the notes are, are pretty good. And we're, I think we're gonna. Did you ask? Um, I talked to Daniel and he said he yes. Going whatever. Order. Yeah. So I talked to someone. So it should be EJ, Daniel, someone. Oh. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. Opposite of us. Got it. So do we have enough mics? Yeah. So they're gonna pass this one around. Okay. Um, we have a couple of these. Left. This one is the one you're going to use. Mm -hmm. uh, what, is, what about this one? This is the one Dustin knows what to do with this one, and I find him in nature. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>
need like anyone up here during the recording or besides like people who are being recorded or is there like we all good to be back there? Yeah, yeah. I'll just come by I'll just come over here between each thing. Yeah, and Mike's the next person up. Okay. Okay. I'll try to stand in one place on that trip. Okay. Try to be good about that. I'm actually going to put two mics on you. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, see the hashtag bits2017 um, uh, there as well. Okay, so let me uh, give you a little bit of overview about the meeting today and uh, tomorrow. Some of you have already uh, gotten started this morning with the training session. And uh, so you're, you're already warmed up, but, but others maybe have just, uh, ju just gotten started. Uh, I'm Ted Miguel, a professor of economics here at uh, Berkeley and the faculty director of, uh, of BITS. What I want to do in the next half hour or so is just walk you through some of our activities, um, give you an overview of what BITS is, has been up to, what are some of our uh, accomplish, accomplishments have been over the last year, but also some of our plans and goals for the coming year, just to start a conversation around um, certain, certain projects. And, and, you know, I think these conversations will continue on throughout the day today and, uh, and tomorrow. So just as a starting point for people kind of new to the research transparency or, or open science space, uh, what, what motivated a, a bunch of us here, some of us here at Berkeley, many and you know many more in other institutions to establish bits about five years ago, was our concern about the state of uh, research in the social sciences, about the quality of evidence, about the the reliability of evidence. There's uh, what you know people have called a credibility crisis in in science overall. It's something that's touched uh, so many of our uh, research fields, including my own field of economics. Uh, medicine, um, uh, political science, etc. And this uh, crisis really takes many different forms. There's a concern that many influential results in our fields may not be reproducible, that you know, findings that we teach, that we learn, that shape our thinking, that shape public policy uh, may be based on quite flimsy evidence. Um, and there are a lot of potential reasons why the evidence base uh, isn't as solid as we would we would like. One possible reason why there is this uh, this problem has to do with what we call specification searching. People call it p hacking. Researcher degrees of freedom. Basically, the the idea being that researchers tend to emphasize and are drawn to findings that they find advantageous in some way that they think editors will like, so they'll be able to publish them. That they think donors or governments will like. Uh, rather than just presenting the evidence as it is. And this is, uh, I think, a pervasive problem in many fields. And I think the fact that it goes by so many different names in different fields just suggests uh, how widespread a, a concern it is. A related issue is uh, concerns over publication bias, that even if researchers aren't doing anything to sort of manipulate their results, consciously or subconsciously, that journal editors favor certain types of results. Maybe results that go against conventional wisdom in a field never get published. Uh, maybe results that, that challenge authority figures in the field never get published. Um, so this is another, come back to that later on in, in the talk today. So let me start with a couple of highlights to give you, you know, to step away from the sort of 30,000 foot view and give you some specifics about what BIT has, BITS has been up to and we plan to do uh, in the coming year. So one of the activities that really has been a, a leading activity of BITS in the last three years or so is what we call our SMART grants, Social Science Meta-Analysis and Research Transparency grants. These are awards. Um, and really, there's a lot of different forms that this research 
uh, has taken, the research that's been funded. Overall, we've received scores of applications. We've ended up funding 22 projects competitively. Um, and they're very high quality projects, very exciting. A number of smart recipients are here uh, in the room. Some scholars are working on issues of basic statistical methodology that is important for uh, research transparency. Others are focusing more on the implementation or doing research on the implementation of particular practices, research transparency practices. So there really is a wide range of, of topics. The work that has been funded so far has resulted in uh, at least 11 uh, papers being produced and others are on the way. These have been, uh, these 11 papers have been posted on the BITS preprint series. So depending on the field, you know, in, in economics we call unpublished papers working papers and other fields are called preprints. BITS has a preprint series. Any of you doing research on research transparency topics which many of you in the room are, please approach us about potentially you know, posting your working paper in, in the BITS preprint series. The 11 um, preprints from smart funded projects have been downloaded an average of 300 times off the BITS preprint site. So they're getting a lot of attention, a lot of traffic, and we, we certainly want to um, uh, make the BITS preprint series the go-to place. So you can go there and see, you know, soon dozens, scores, hundreds of papers on these topics. A number of uh, exciting projects have come out of smart grants. Uh, the uh, Vivalt and Coville uh, study, which, which uh, this is just to give you a sense of the kind of range of topics that SMART has funded, uh, funding uh, issues about false positives and how credible positive results are or significant results are. This has been actually pretty influential work in um, shaping certain policies uh, around pre-analysis plans and elicitation of prior beliefs within the World Bank. So this is research that's actually starting to have a policy, a policy impact. Uh, the Berlig, Prionis, and um, uh, Wolfram panel data and experimental design piece um, is a, more of a statistical methodology piece uh, that, that aims to uh, assist researchers in computing appropriate statistical power calculations, even in complex panel data designs. So a very useful uh, tool to use. And um, the Lens and San piece focuses on a, a kind of classic issue uh, around research transparency, which is the role that selective use of covariates in regression analysis uh, can play in driving statistical significance and actually demonstrating that lots of published results in leading political science journals may not be robust to some tweaks of the covariate set. So very kind of core topics you can see are being funded by SMART. This is just three out of 22, and you know, we're, we're hoping to raise more funding for the SMART program so folks doing cutting edge work in this area continue getting the support they need to advance the agenda. So this is just an example of one of, Siga, of, of BITS's research activities. Another major part of what BITS has been up to in the last year and really over the last few years is carrying out training courses on research transparency. We've carried out a number of them as sort of summer institutes here in Berkeley the last, I think, four years. And you can see here uh, there was, you know, over 100 applicants to our recent uh, training course, about 50 learners in the course. So we're reaching, you know, good no large numbers of folks. And I see a number of people in the room that actually participated in some of these. Uh, these training courses. Um, so the, the, the sort of Berkeley uh, site has, has, has really been active in terms of training courses, but we've actually expanded beyond Berkeley. Uh, we had a training course, an international training course in Europe, in London, um, just a, a couple months ago, again, with several dozen learners. There were a lot of applicants for the course, and a number of BITS affiliates in Europe actually carried the loan in terms of the training course. So again, the network has, has really started growing. There's been a lot of interest, uh, you know, globally in these, uh, the, these courses. The training courses in Berkeley and in London are multi-day courses, uh, very intense sort of all-day lectures, workshops, hands-on activities uh, to help graduate students, postdocs, young scholars, even some mid-career scholars gain the tools they need to be open science, open social scientists. Uh, and, uh, and I think that 
you know, actually a number of people who have taken part in the trainings and have gone on to apply for Smart Grant awards and, and take part in other BITS activities uh, as well. One of the uh, sort of new activities over the last year and one of the things we're, we're very happy about is a new open, massive open online course that BITS uh, launched this past year with FutureLearn, which is a UK-based online uh, platform. It's called Transparent and Open uh, Social Science Research. And uh, we, we didn't know exactly what to expect when the first course run took place over the summer. We thought maybe a few hundred people might be interested in it. It turned out there were 1,200 folks who enrolled in the course. About 400 were called active learners. Basically, the, the platform gauges how often you're actually watching videos and doing homework. Um, so there are about 400 folks who uh, were active learners. So it really gives you a sense of how these online approaches can get you to scale very quickly. Um, so we're very happy about that. For folks who, are in, who missed this last course run, who are interested in it for themselves, who are maybe interested in it for their students or members of their lab, the next course run is in January. It goes for about five weeks and it covers eight major topics on research transparency and reproducibility. There's also homeworks and assignments. Part of the reason they do these course runs is so students taking the course can interact in discussion groups and interact with each other. Um, so it's a really great experience and um, hopefully some of you can check it out. And I think, let me see if I'm able to show you the, what it looks like. I'll have to drag this over, hold on. Um, yeah, so this is basically if, if you, you know, click on the link, we'll share these slides, it'll take you to uh, the, the Future Learn page. It's very easy to enroll, and um, there's Berkeley. So, um, and it basically covers these major topics in uh, open science and research transparency. So we definitely encourage you to, to consider taking the course. Let me see if I can drag this back. All right. Okay. Um, another new part of BITS's activities over the past couple years has been our expansion of what we call our catalyst network. So BITS is fundamentally a network of researchers interested in open social science. We are grassroots, we are ground up, and the catalyst network is really like the sort of embodiment of, of, of the network. It makes it real, it makes it tangible. What catalysts do is they take uh, the material they've learned in a, in a training course, online, they develop their own material, and BITS provides funding for them to teach a course or a workshop or develop some modular teaching materials uh, for their home institution. So it's a way to keep spreading um, the message and the tools and the principles of open science beyond what BITS could do or a couple other groups could do on their own with our own training courses. So we're really excited about the, the interest in the Catalyst Network. There have been so many folks eager to sort of take the message forward. Um, there are now 100 Catalysts. We just reached 100 Catalysts in 29 countries. You can see the, um, the, the countries on the map here where the Catalysts have been active. Uh, again, carrying out workshops, seminars, um, et cetera. We have another map of just the US. So we have Catalysts in a couple dozen states in the US. Uh, also actively working in, in, in many different um, institutions. So the amount of excitement and energy and interest around these topics just continues to grow and BITS is just so grateful to be able to be part of this, uh, this change and provide funding to allow people to, to carry these ideas and, and methods to their home institution. Um, so again, just a couple of details about the the program, uh, just in the past year, there's been quite a bit of support, a few hundred thousand dollars of uh, support and uh, reaching several thousand learners directly through these training, training courses. And again, uh, a very wide range of countries have now had uh, BITS Catalyst uh, courses or workshops uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, uh, et cetera. One Catalyst actually down at UC San Diego developed some online modular course materials that are uh, you can access here through this link. So again, we're really building up, helping to, to build up the um, sort of uh, teaching materials in this area as well. 
Okay, another new development in the field, just to kind of give you a sense of what BITS has been up to and start conversations and brainstorming really about what BITS should be, be doing next. Um, we've made some progress in um, advancing a new article, type of article format called re a registered report. Some of you may be familiar with registered reports from either psychology journals or neuroscience journals. They do exist in some fields. There's never been, to our knowledge, registered reports in economics. Um, and I think there's only a handful in, 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 a, in a few other fields. Maybe in political science, there have been a few um, pilots of, of registered reports or, or cases. A registered report is different than a regular article submission. What a, an author does, if you're not familiar with registered reports, is they submit an article to a journal laying out their research questions, laying out their research design, laying out the data they plan to use and the, the tests that they plan to run. But they do that before they have access to the data, before they've run any analysis. So it's a lot like a pre-analysis plan, but even more fleshed out. Um, and journals then evaluate these submissions based on the quality of the question, the design, the data, but without knowing how the results will turn out. So the point of this is to get around the problem of publication bias and specification searching that I mentioned up front. If editors can judge a paper or you know, a project on design and data and question and not sort of ding it because it gets unusual results or not want to publish it because it goes against conventional wisdom, that's, that's a step forward for science. There's going to be less suppression of new types of results, hopefully, uh, with, with, with this kind of article format. So once it's submitted, it goes through a refereeing process and the articles get some sort of conditional acceptance. They then go back, get the data, analyze it, submit the paper, but the editor has committed not to base publication based on uh, you know, whether you get a significant result or not, but just based on, again, the quality of the data and the design. Of course, between when you submit the, the registered report to a journal and when you actually submit it, you know, there could be a, a breakdown in data collection, there could be a coup in the country you're doing research in, there could be a problem in the lab. You may never end up uh, writing it up or the data could look different and then the, there, there's, you know, uh, a chance to, for the editor and the author to have a conversation about sort of how close you need to be to the original submission. Uh, to be published. But these are the sorts of details that are already being worked out in psychology and neuroscience and we need to start the conversation around them in economics. That's, that's what BITS has been pushing for and we actually have forged a partnership for a pilot effort to uh, allow registered report submissions in the Journal of Development Economics, a major journal in, in, in our field, um, starting in the first quarter of 2018. So if you are working in international development in some way, shape, or form, and you're interested in taking part in this uh, submission uh, process to be published, the plan is to be published in the, in the full-on JDE, uh, Journal of Development Economics, um, keep your eyes open, be in touch with BITS. We're going to be publicizing it when the submission link goes live and you're able to submit a registered report to the Journal of Development Economics, but it's something we've been working on over the last year and very excited to try to bring a new article format that has all of these conceptual advantages into, into economics. Um, and you know, again, we've been learning very much through the BITS network from other fields that have already had this article format. And that's really one of the advantages of the BITS network is this communication across disciplines. I wouldn't have even heard of registered reports if were it not for BITS. And we're not for meetings like this and conversations with colleagues in different fields. Okay, so let me talk a little more about the agenda for today and then the agenda for tomorrow. Um, the uh, meeting this year really has incredibly high quality speakers and presenters. I'm so excited for the next uh, day and a half. Um, after my intro talk uh, here, we're going to be turning to a keynote panel uh, discussing what we call the strength of evidence and statistical significance thresholds, a discussion uh, with three distinguished speakers whom I'll introduce in a few minutes when we, when we launch the panel. Some of you may have uh, heard over the last few months about the debate over p-values and what the appropriate threshold for sig statistical significance should be. There's advocates for lowering the, the, the p-value threshold. Some of them are here today. They're advocates for maybe retaining the threshold or abandoning the threshold and different perspectives in between. Um, it's created quite a stir in academic debate and also in the popular media. So it's very exciting to have uh, some of the leading scholars in this discussion here today. 
our plan for um, this panel is to each of the speakers will sort of give their take on the on the issue, but then we're going to open it up for uh, conversation and discussion with all of you as interested parties in this discussion, as researchers or aspiring researchers, um, to see what kind of consensus we can all reach, if any, uh, during the conversation. Um, we'll follow that uh, panel with a, uh, a coffee break and then move on to our second panel called Institutionalizing uh, Research Transparency. We're also incredibly honored to have uh, representatives of several large um, organizations, many of them leading funders in the international economic development space here to discuss their progress and challenges in incorporating research transparency practices into their own work, into their own research groups, into their own dissemination. Um, there's a lot that we have developed for, um, you know, mainly by and for academic researchers that can be, that's just highly applicable to policy oriented researchers and researchers in development banks. We're going to have a discussion about that um, today, followed by the awarding of the Lemur Rosenthal Prizes for Open Social Science. Again, people who have been in our annual meetings the last couple of years uh, have heard about all the inspiring work uh, being done by Lemur Rosenthal Prize recipients. These are really uh, folks at the frontier of these topics developing new methods, teaching us new facts, developing new uh, ways to, to teach the material. And we're just delighted to be able to have a number of the Lima Rosenthal uh, winners here today uh, for, for this award. And I should also mention that Ed Lemer uh, is here today. He's actually sitting in the middle table right over there. The, this prize is, is named for Ed and his pioneering work um, <clears throat> starting 30, 35 years ago that really changed the debate in economics and planted the seeds for the kind of progress that we're making today on research transparency um, and open science. At the end of the day today, we're going to turn to a reception. I think just in the back of this room, there'll be some refreshments and maybe we can just keep the conversations going that were started by the, by the hopefully thought provoking uh, panels today. Okay, tomorrow's agenda, hopefully most of you can stick around uh, for tomorrow. Tomorrow is broken down into four different research sessions. Each of the sessions has two or three presentations. And these are, these are presentations of new research. Some of them are, are research that was funded through the SMART program. Others are Catalyst. Others are, are, non, are not BITS funded in any way. Uh, but these are just leading uh, scholars coming up with, uh, you know, basically presenting to us their new research in the area. The first session focuses on publication bias, one of these core topics in in the field and the challenges around uh, addressing this, th this issue. The second session uh, has to do with data sharing and trying to understand the, maybe the benefits of data sharing, the cost of data sharing, what limitations there might be to data sharing, another key part of, of transparency. Um, the third session is more methods focused and we'll dive into new tools that many of us in the room who are mainly doing quantitative social science research or related research uh, could use in our own in our own work and the fourth session will uh, dive into further discussion on this very important issue of researcher degrees of freedom p hacking specification searching again one one really core core area so again I is the last session this closed closing discussion what we'll do for hopefully most of you will still be able to stick around is take 30 minutes 45 minutes however long it takes to brainstorm as a research community and as a research network useful directions for the coming year. What are the things that BITS or affiliated groups or just researchers in general should be doing to, an, an, to advance an open social science agenda? Um, where are we falling short? So it's a really fun way to reflect on a day and a half of exciting talks, think about the gaps and sort of plot a way forward um, as well. So this is the, the, the layout of, of, of today and, um, and tomorrow. Without any further ado, I think what I'm going to do is call up, we're going to go directly to our first panel, and I'll call up our speakers um, to take their place here at the table. They have um, presentations prepared, but again, we're going to leave a lot of time for, for discussion. I'll be moderating that discussion. Uh, our first speaker is Samin Vazir of UC Davis. Um, do you want to come on up? 
Yeah, you'll go third. Yeah, you can go third. Uh, maybe, maybe all of you. Oh, so should we go up in, okay, come up one at a time and then the panel at the end. That's the best way to do it. Yeah. So do, do you guys want to stay there while others are presenting? Maybe that, that makes the most sense. Okay. So then we're going to start with EJ. Um, Wagenmachers, is he? Okay. So we're going to start with EJ and then we'll go on to Daniel and then we'll go on to Samin. Sorry about the, the ordering. Um, Okay, so E.J. Wagenmachers from University of Amsterdam uh, is professor at the Methodology Unit of the Department of Psychology. Uh, he's PI on the European Research Council grant Bayes or Bust, Sensible Hypothesis Tests for Social Science. In 2016, he received a Lima Rosenthal Prize for Open Social Science for his design and leadership of the graduate level course Good Research Practices at the University of Amsterdam. And he's been an active participant in the debate over p-value thresholds. So we should get your talk actually up here. Um, you have slides, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, All right, and is it control L? Let's see. No, oh no. Oh. What's that? Sorry. A slideshow. Full screen? Either way. Slideshow. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, this course, Good Research Practices. I'm teaching it uh, at the University of Amsterdam in this semester. And so this discussion is actually part of an assignment that the students have to do. So I have to watch the debate and then answer some questions about it. Okay, so as long as you stand over here. Yeah. You're, you're okay. I guess it makes me hurry up. Okay, let's see if I can outpace the timer. Um, I uh, do want to keep this uh, short because most of you will be familiar with the general uh, uh, topic. So, um, if you want more details, uh, there's a, a, a blog that I'm doing uh, um, based in spectacles, and it has a number of entries on this particular problem, most of them written together with uh, one of my students, Quinton Gronau. So I, I would direct you to that for more information. We have about 11 posts on this topic right now. So there's two points that I want to make. One is about how to intuit the strength of evidence. I feel that's really important when we're, when we're talking about evidence. And the second one is that p-values just below 0.05 are weak, give you weak evidence, not just occasionally or sometimes, but always under any plausible analysis. That's really important. And I will uh, demonstrate this to you using the JASP program. I don't know whether JASP is installed on this computer, but I made screenshots. So, uh, so this is the uh, intuition for the strength of evidence that uh, a base factor provides. So uh, here we go, we have a base factor, for instance, of three, which means that the observed data are three times more likely to have occurred under the alternative hypothesis than under the null hypothesis. So three to one. Now assuming that the alternative and the null are equally likely a priori, we can transform this to a probability, so a proportion. So uh, a base factor of three relates to a Okay, so now we, we have this probability, but 75% is that strong evidence, is that weak evidence. It's a very concrete number, but people might still not really intuit how strong right? So there's three quarters is covered by the blue balloons and one uh, quarter is covered by the yellow balloon. And in order to really understand how much evidence, how surprised are you? 
Well, in this particular case, you wouldn't be very surprised. You wouldn't be a little surprised, but you probably wouldn't be surprised enough to write an article about it in which you reject the null hypothesis. Nevertheless, when we analyze p-values that are just below 0.05, the level of evidence is almost always lower than the evidence that you see in this pizza plot. And that should be cause for great concern. OK, so uh, let me demonstrate this to you. I could have picked any example, but uh, I, just, uh, I just took one that I uh, ran into recently. Oh, yeah, and so you can do all of, all of this really easily with a couple of, couple of uh, mouse clicks in the uh, free program JASP that we have been developing at the University of Amsterdam. It does classical analyses, frequentist analyses, but it also does Bayesian analyses. So this uh, result that I'm going to discuss is, uh, was published this year in The Lancet. Now they do a number of studies in this article, and I'm going to focus on the last one, and I'll show you the data immediately. So it's a, a, a correlation. Um, these are 13 patients with post-traumatic stress disorder. And what you see on the um, uh, x-axis is perceived stress. And on the y-axis is the activity in the amygdala. The idea is that people with a, an amygdala that is more active report more stress. Right? But then when you look at the numbers more closely, you see this is Impossible to see for you guys probably at this distance, but I'll tell you, uh, the correlation is 0.56, and the p-value is 0.0485, so just below 0.05. And at this point, alarm bells should start to go off. And uh, this uh, reminded me uh, of uh, Shaquille O'Neal, the big Aristotle, who uh, speaks of a barbecue chicken alert in these kinds of cases. So what does he mean when he says this? He means that something is really very easy. You don't have to run after the chicken to catch it first. You don't have to pluck the chicken or cook it. It's just there for the taking, and you could do this all day. And similarly, when I see p-values just below 0.05, I can go to JASP, I can do a Bayesian analysis, and it will always show that the evidence is weak at best. So that's what we uh, can do here. So p-value 0.049 barbecue chicken alert. So this is a Bayesian analysis. Obviously, I don't have time to discuss everything that you see here. But the most important point for this very short presentation is that base factor that is about 2. Right, so, yes, there is some evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis, but it's, it's not really compelling. You see that we present a little pizza plot there as well. So imagine the spinner and it pointing to the white area. How surprised are you? Not at all surprised. Now, this is just one analysis. And in, in uh, the Bayesian paradigm, we have prior distributions. You could choose all kinds of different prior distributions. In JASP, we have a button for this. You can click, and then you get an analysis that shows you base factors across a wide range of prior distributions. So I don't have time to go into the detail, but what you see here is that on the x-axis, every point there is a different prior distribution. And on the y-axis, you see the evidence. Right? And important here is that no matter how we choose this prior distribution, the evidence is never compelling. And in fact, you see that it's fairly constant no matter what you do with this prior distribution. Right? So I believe that instead of presenting a number, say, p equals 0.049, reject the null hypothesis, where you make an all or none decision based on weak evidence, it would be much more careful, modest, and appropriate to, for instance, present results like these, like this, this, these two pictures tell you much more about what's really going on. Now, so this is really what I wanted people to do. But um, we are in the real world, and so I don't expect everybody to suddenly download JASP and do all these Bayesian analyses. So as a method to prevent me from shouting barbecue chicken alert and doing this to every paper with a p-value just below 0.05, 
we, a group of 72 authors, propose to lower the threshold for significance from 0.05 to 0.005, because that prevents me from doing this. P-values around 0.005 will give us base factors of about 20 to 1. And that's kind of the level of evidence that people often think a p-value provides, but doesn't. So uh, be aware of all p-values just below 0.05. Um, so the, 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 you may wonder, what's the reason for this discrepancy? Well, in the, the base factor we saw, it compares how probable the data are under the null versus a specific alternative, and it's the weight of the, of the two that determines the evidence. When you compute a p-value, you only look at one side of the coin. Only the null hypothesis is considered. And that, and that is one of the reasons we find this, uh, this discrepancy. So bold claims require strong evidence, and you should all install JASP because it's a user-friendly program that allows you to easily do a host of uh, statistical analyses. And that's it. Thank you very much. All right, our next, <coughs> our next speaker is Daniel Lakins. All right, let me open up. Let me try to. Yeah, you want your PDF or PowerPoint? Uh, PowerPoint's better, yeah, there it is, yeah, let's do it. Okay. <clears throat> Great. All right, so let me just introduce our next speaker, Daniel Lakins uh, from Eindhoven University. He's assistant professor of psychology uh, at Eindhoven University of Technology. His work focuses on how to design and interpret studies, applied metastatistics, and reward structures in science. He's one of the recipients of the 2017 Lima Rosenthal Award as a leader in education for his Improving Your Statistical Inferences Online course. Yeah, all right. All right, hi. So I think um, one of the things that the paper that AJ just mentioned uh, does really well is make people think about where their, their alpha level and their level of um, evidence that they desire should be. And that's good because uh, this is something that people have been unhappy about, that people are unthinkingly applying some sort of rule for a long time. And people have brought up this issue again and again. Uh, and I'm a little bit surprised that now so many people are thinking about this, but that's excellent. So that's really nice about this paper. Um, on the other hand, again, people have been criticizing this use of p-values for about 50 years. Uh, you might think, so what's new this time? And actually not so much. If you take a look at the main novel claim that's in this, uh, this paper by these 72 authors, then I think it's this. I mean, the statistical, statistical argument has been known uh, that are presented. But the main thing here is that actually the point that the authors make is that now there is a critical mass of researchers now endorsing this change. That's really what they say. They say, well, statisticians have known that the relative weakness of using this, it, this was all known. But the, the thing is, there's now a critical mass. And I find this a very interesting thing. So what does that actually mean? What, does, what makes 72 researchers a critical mass? And it also makes me think what the other people, like myself, what, so what are we then? I'm, I'm not really sure. Now, this topic is not specifically new. I wrote a blog post about this, not to say that I you know, thought about this before, but this is sort of the reason why we wrote a paper about this, because I already wrote a blog post in 2014, why psychologists should ignore recommendations to use an alpha level of 0 .0, or, or 0 .0, 0 0.001. Uh, then it was 0 0.001 uh, a couple of years later, and we're at 0 0.005. I think if we wait another five years, we'll meet somewhere in the middle, and everybody's actually happy. But now we're discussing uh, 0 0.05. Now, the, the point that AJ mentioned, I'm 
completely in agreement about. So these p-values are a uh, low evidential threshold if they're just below 0 0.05. Actually, this is um, an assignment from my MOOC that I teach, um, where I let people plot p-curves. Um, this is one for a situation where you have very high power, and you can see that the, the bar on the right, that's p-values between 0 0.04 and 0 0.05, it's very low, and actually if you take a look, it's below the red line. There's a small red line there, it's almost not visible maybe, but this red line is what you would expect, the p-value distribution, if the null hypothesis is true. So in this case, if you have really high power, it's true that you can find a statistically significant result, but that's actually more likely if no hypothesis is true than when the alternative hypothesis is true. This is exactly the same point, and I test my students about this, how they should interpret p-values under this circumstance. So it's not that this is a disagreement. And again, this point, like, yeah, the question is, what should we do about it? And people have been debating this and thinking about this for a long time as well. This is my favorite. Um, solution if you want to keep track of the evidence in p-values. It's not to set a uniform threshold. Uh, I don't like uniform thresholds. That's the whole problem that we're in and I'd rather not have a new threshold, have a real solution. This is by Good 1982 where he suggests that you correct the p-value based on the sample size that you have. So the bigger the sample size, the smaller the alpha level that you actually use as a critical value, which makes sense, right? This is a good approach. So <clears throat> I had blocked about why I think we shouldn't have a uniform new lower threshold. And then this paper came out and a lot of people on social media said, Daniel, you're going to write a commentary about this, right? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Is this an issue? Um, and more and more people did this. And eventually we ended up with 88 people writing in a Google Doc about this. It was actually a, a lovely writing experience with 88 total strangers. We wrote a pretty nice commentary where we make three main points. So why do we think that this is not a good idea? So first I think, and I'll briefly have, I have one slide about all these points, but I think there's really not enough evidence that this new threshold will actually improve replicability enough. The second point is that the justification for the new threshold is not something that I'm particularly impressed about. And finally, there could be negative consequences of having this threshold. And if you want to implement a new policy, you should think carefully about possible negative side effects. So why is there not enough evidence that in practice it's going to improve replicability? Well, we don't have a lot of data of how replications work depending on their p-value, but there's this one project, uh, I'm a co-author of this uh, paper, one of the 266 or something, um, where we replicated the 100 studies in psychology. And the, the bar on the left, just below 50% replication rate, that is for p-value smaller than 0 0.005. So this is the new threshold and then, well, this is the only sort of objective data point that we have. We would end up with a replication rate of about 47%. It's not very high, right? It's not even looking very good, but okay. The question is, is it better than the other p-values on the right? Yeah, it's a little bit of a mess, right? We don't have a lot of data. Is it better? Maybe a little bit. How much? We don't really know. So there's not a lot of evidence how much is going to help in practice. The second point, yeah, I mean, in the paper we make a small joke that if you actually test how much better it is, then the evidence itself is actually not uh, according to the new threshold. Um, the second point is, do we want to have an alpha level, which is basically your error rate, right? How often do you want to say that there's something when there's actually nothing? Do you want to have this based on the level of evidence? There are some people, and I would point you to this blog by Stefan Sen, who's one of my favorite statisticians, and the picture also comes from him. Stop, um, stop um, deforming the p-value into a second-rate, second-class Bayesian probability. So we don't necessarily have to choose the error rate based on the level of evidence. You can do it. It's one possible justification, but you don't have to do it. And if you do it, you might want to think, why do I think a type 1 error is 40 times more problematic than a type 2 error, which we probably going to leave at 20% if we power our studies at 80%. So this feels unbalanced. A second justification in the paper is based on the false positive report probability, which requires that you have some assumption about the prior probability that we test hypotheses that are true. We also don't have a lot of data about this, very few data points, so it's very unclear. 
a very sort of yeah, doubtful way to justify this threshold. And the third is, if we are going to change policies, what's going to be the consequence for this? And I think that this is not a question for statisticians. The first two points are things that statisticians can discuss. This third thing is something that psychologists and economists need to discuss. So what are the consequences of setting this lower threshold? What are the problems for, for example, well, if you want to set a lower threshold, you need more resources to, do, to reach this threshold. Uh, sort of 70% higher or 88% more uh, participants if you do a one-sided test. So if you've used up your resources, yeah, you don't have anything left. And we might think that nowadays more people are doing replication research, but if you need more resources for your novel resource uh, research, are they also going to do these replication studies or is there a negative effect on the number of replication studies people do? Another thing is what, what are the consequences for difficult to reach populations? If you do research on people, it's not easy to find a lot of them. Well, you can still, of course, do the research. The proposal is just to redefine significance, so your study should still be publishable. But will this really be the case? Will it be as impressive as other types of studies? Will people move on to do more research online? We don't really know the consequences, so I think that's important to think about. We have a very modest proposal, and I think it's nice also because before I said, yeah, in 2014, I said, just ignore these recommendations to lower alpha levels. But now we had to think, so what, what else should we do? And we have a very, very weird proposal. Basically, justify what you're doing. Don't just do a mindless sort of default, but make an informed decision and justify it in your paper. And then we thought, we don't even know how to do this, to be honest. We are now struggling because we committed to this idea ourselves, and now we're, we have no idea. But I guess it's useful because it points out that we have to figure out and help people to make these choices. Finally, I just wanted to highlight my personal disappointment. So this is not for all the other authors, maybe some agree. But my personal disappointment with this proposal is that if we have this very problematic situation, so we have people doing a lot of things wrong, right? They place too much weight on single p-values. They treat p-values as evidence, which is sort of doubtful. They p-hack, they selectively report then I don't think that we really have a replicability problem, but we have an education problem. Right? People don't know how to do good research, and we can lower the threshold, but I have doubts whether their theoretical hypotheses are interesting enough and those kind of things. So is redefining statistical significance, significance an actionable step that improves the replicability of science? Maybe, maybe. To some extent, we don't really know how far. But only if you have a slightly different definition of what improving is, I don't think it improves science, and maybe science itself, right? I mean, we really, really want people to do good, good research. And for that, we just need to educate people. I think that's more important than giving them a new threshold to follow. All right, thanks. And these are all the people on the paper. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so our third panelist is uh, Samin Vazir from UC Davis. <coughs> uh, she's Associate Professor of Psychology and Director of the Personality and Self-Knowledge Laboratory at UC Davis, co-founder and president of the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, SIPS, and senior editor of the journal Calabra Psychology. And she's also a recipient of the 2017 Lima Rosenthal Award as a leader in education. And let me just close this. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. It feels a little bit like my Twitter feed came to life. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my reasons for co-signing the 0.005 proposal. And I want to start by talking about some things that I think that we all agree on, or uh, many people agree on, despite whatever position they take on the 0.005 thing in particular. Um, and one is that the status quo is not good. We don't like the status quo. We all, or many people involved in this debate, more generally think that the status quo needs to change. I think we also many agree that in an ideal world, people would, researchers would think through all of their decisions and they would not just take the time to think through it, but they would think through it well. They would be smart and they would be uh, well-trained and they would also not be biased and not make um, self-interested decisions about their research practices. Um, 
and they would make all that thought process and decision making transparent. And in this ideal world, the researchers would have all these qualities, but also, and maybe even more implausibly, the editors and reviewers would be smart and wise and well-trained and never make mistakes and be morally good people who are not biased. So I would love to live in that world, and I think in that world, the justify your alpha proposal would absolutely be the best way to go. And I, I'm, I haven't given up hope that we can live in that world, but we don't yet. And so for me, the alpha 0.05 solution is a solution for the meantime, until we get to that world where researchers and editors and reviewers are all very, very thoughtful and wise and unbiased. Um, and as somebody who has done quite a bit of editing and reviewing, really the appeal to me of this proposal is what, can we, what could we do tomorrow? So before pre-registration is widespread, before everybody is completely transparent, et cetera. And I feel that many of the alternative proposals, not just Justify Your Alpha, but the Gelman, Tackett, McShane, et al. proposal and others um, require other things. They require transparency, right? We need to be able to verify people's uh, subjective decisions about alpha or other research practices. And until we have that, right, what can we do in the meantime? So the alpha of 0.05 proposal is admittedly an imperfect solution. It's not a solution to everything. In fact, I think it's, it's giving up on some things um, in order to have something sooner, right? It's kind of the eating the marshmallow now solution. Um, but I think the advantage is that it doesn't require waiting until transparency and pre-registration are more widespread. It's something we could do right away. We don't need to convince people to abandon null hypothesis significance testing or to abandon thresholds or necessarily even to pre-register, although we should be pushing for many of those things anyway. So in my view, the, it boils down to my decision to, of whether to contribute to the 0.005 paper or not boils down to do I think that changing alpha to 0.005 is better than keeping it at 0.05. And I feel like that, to me, is pretty uncontroversial. That If we had to choose between those two worlds, I would choose the 0.005 world over the 0.05 world. And I think that's not an extreme claim. So now I'm going to anticipate some, some uh, criticisms. So one, that I'll just, I don't, I haven't heard very much. I don't hear too many people talking about that. Daniel alluded to it a little bit, but the idea that type two error rates could go way up if we use 0.005. And I think there's a couple of responses to that. One is that the increase in sample size you would need for an alpha of 0.005 is not as much bigger as you might think. It's reducing the alpha by, you know, it's one tenth the alpha rate, but requires only about 70% bigger samples. Um, also, the other counter argument I would say to that is that if we are, if we're uh, worried about the imbalance in type one to type two error rates, and we're assuming that type two error is 20%, I think that's not a correct assumption. And you might expect me to say type two error is way higher than 20% because power is lower than 80%. But actually, that's not what I think. I think type 2 error is way lower than 20% because we have p-hacking and harking and so on. Um, I'm not worried about false negatives entering the literature and having these like huge consequences for people not following up on true effects because they're not entering the literature. If that changes, I think we need to worry more about the balance of type 1 and type 2 error. Another criticism is that hard and fast rules are bad. So why should we have another hard and fast rule? And I agree, and that's why I don't think the rule should be hard and fast. I think there should be some flexibility around it. Um, just like I think there should be, when we were back in the 0.05 world, well, we're still in the 0.05 world, but in that world, I think we should allow people to make a case for why they're not using 0.05 as their alpha. And I think the same would be true if we adopt 0.005 as the threshold for statistical significance. We should definitely allow for people to make a case for using a different alpha. Um, but I think it's useful to have a default, something that you don't need to convince people if you're going to use this. You only need to convince us if you're going to loosen it up a little bit. Another criticism is that you can still p-hack to 0.005. Um, and I would say, yes, of course, you can p-hack to any value, but I think it's undeniably harder to p-hack to 0.005 than 0.05. I still haven't understood the argument, and I've read the Harry Crane paper, I've read other papers, I've not seen an argument for how it can't be harder to p-hack to 0.005 than to 0.05. Um, and I think the question is how much harder, and I haven't seen any good simulations or empirical evidence about that. Um, but I think it's undeniably harder. It's at least a little bit harder to p-hack to 0.005 than to 0.05. So, and why does that matter? Why does it matter that it's at least a little bit harder? So here's my analogy. It also has to do with pizzas. I didn't know EJ would talk about pizza. Um, so I was thinking about this on the train down from Davis yesterday. And this is the analogy I came up with. So it's it's brand new, so, so help me out if it, if, the, if it falls apart. 
So let's say p-hacking is like eating pizza when you really should be eating healthy food. And p-hacking is pretty tempting when the pizza is really easy to get to. So if there's a pizza place just down the block from me, it's going to be really tempting to go eat the pizza instead of the healthy food that's further away, that's harder to get to. And the healthy food in this example is not p-hacking, using good research practices, sticking to the rules of NHST if you're using NHST. So what we're proposing with 0.005 is just moving the pizza store a little bit further away. How much further away? I don't know. Maybe it's a lot further away. Maybe it's a lot harder to p-hack to 0.005. Maybe it's only a little further away. But there's some chance that by moving it further away, the healthy option will become more attractive than the unhealthy option. So the idea is if we can make p-hacking less attractive, right, then maybe not p-hacking will be an easier solution. It'll actually just people will be like, okay, fine. I don't, I, I don't have the resources to p-hack to 0.05 or I don't have the patience or whatever. I might as well try it the right way. So that's kind of my hope about why it matters that it's harder to p-hack to 0.005 than 0.05. But it's true that the validity of that argument depends on how much harder. Another um, criticism, and in my view, the, the most important and valid criticism of this um, proposal is that anything that, that requires larger samples, that requires more effort in order to claim a discovery, will encourage people to use the cheapest methods even when those aren't the best methods. And that is absolutely true, and that is something that every proposal for reform that increases the standards of evidence is going to have to deal with. If we require more evidence and we don't counterbalance that with something else, we're going to be driving people to use the cheapest methods available. Sometimes that's fine, sometimes those are bad methods. Like, you know, over-reliance on convenience samples or questionnaire measures or reaction time measures rather than more intensive measures. So this is a real issue that we need to take seriously. And what taking this issue seriously means to me is a couple of things. One is that a lot of this uh, credibility and replicability movement has been focused on statistical validity, and we need to be paying a lot of attention to things like construct validity, external validity, internal validity. So this needs to be a push for increasing all kinds of validity, not just statistical validity. And if we do that, then we will take into account, did they use the most appropriate methods? Did they use the most appropriate population, et cetera? And if you if you go cheap on those in order to get more statistical validity, you will be dinged for that, that all of those things matter and you can't sacrifice one for the other. The other thing I think that taking this issue seriously means is to develop ways, you know, BITS and uh, Society for Improvement of Psychological Science and the Center for Open Science and many other groups are in the business of developing tools to help researchers. And one of the kinds of tools we need to be developing are tools that will level the playing field to make it easier to use these good, strong methods um, with fewer resources. So instead of, if people are being driven to use cheap methods when they shouldn't be, then let's make it easier for them to use the right, most valid methods. And what does that mean? Well, one example that I think is great is a, a couple of projects that came out of the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, namely StudySwap, which is, I call it like an online dating platform for researchers, but not for dating, but for recruiting participants, gathering data. So basically you can post a study that you want others to run for you, or you can say, I have a few hundred participants this year. If you want me to add your study to my protocol, we can collect data for you. Um, and so that makes it possible for people who don't have a lot of resources to collect data um, this way, or for people to collect more uh, diverse samples than they otherwise could at their own institution, et cetera. Another similar uh, project is the Psych Science Accelerator, which is, again, an opportunity for people from many different many different labs across the world to come together and help collect data collaboratively. So those kinds of projects, I think, are going to really help address this issue of driving people to use cheaper and maybe less valid methods if we require more evidence. Um, another criticism of the 0.05 proposal is that dichotomous thinking is bad. I'm way too cynical to think we'll ever get rid of threshold thinking. Um, I also think, look, we can do both, right? We can accept that right now thresholds exist and that dichotomous thinking is there and let's make it a little bit better, but also at the same time push for more nuance and, and more training and so on. So we d these aren't mutually exclusive. Um, and the other answer I have to the argument that dichotomous thinking is bad is correct, so let's have three categories instead of two, right? So adding the 0.05 threshold and then calling things below that statistically significant and then having a category for things between 0.005 and 0.05 and calling them suggestive, now we have three categories, so it's a little bit better than two categories. Um, so um, in conclusion, I want to say that another, another thing 
One of, I wasn't surprised at the reaction to the 0.05 uh, proposal, but I find one thing about it interesting, which is that in psychology, in response to the replicability crisis, many people said, oh, well, of course, we always knew that single studies were not conclusive, we're not dumb, like, of course, we don't treat them as conclusive. But then we let people in the discussion section of their articles get away with making quite strong claims. And then we also let those findings find their way into the media and into public policy and so on. So if we all know that we shouldn't be drawing strong conclusions from weak evidence, then let's just walk the walk, right? If we all know that 0.04 is weak evidence and we shouldn't be rushing to conclusions, then let's actually say that you're not allowed to call it statistically significant unless it's more extreme than that. Um, so in, in my mind, there's a way of painting this proposal as just um, formalizing something that we claim that we all believe, that we claim that we all practice, but we often see people not practicing in their discussion sections and in the media. So, this w so I think that the, the looser system of saying, oh, of course we all know 0.04 is weak evidence, don't worry, we don't need a rule. My reaction is, I think we kind of do need a rule. I think we haven't been behaving ourselves when it comes to interpreting that weak evidence and being calibrated and cautious about drawing conclusions. Okay, that's all I have. Great. That was really, really exciting and, and interesting. Do you, you need to mic me up or no? I'm going to oh. do something with Okay. With if you can just give me one second. Great, thanks a lot. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of material there, a lot of, of interesting ideas. Let me just start off with one one question, um, and I have some thoughts about it, but maybe just a way to start a conversation. Um, different fields have very different costs of data collection, and um, uh, so in development economics, in my field, certain experiments are done at pretty large scale, village scale, across dozens or hundreds of villages. They're quite expensive. They're difficult to carry out, very expensive projects. Um, what are your views, uh, sort of all three of you, uh, what, what are your views on, um, on the sort of role of customized p-values by field, or maybe the role for research communities, separate research communities facing different constraints. You know, collecting fMRI data is more expensive than collecting online samples. Development economics is, you know, data collection is costlier than maybe labor economics. Who knows? What, what, what do you see about moving, again, beyond this is the threshold versus that is the threshold, and uh, sort of discipline-specific conversations. So just wanted to throw that out there. And I think if you could use the mic, whoever wants to go, maybe you can all take a turn. But I think it's on. If not, do you know if that, if that mic is on? If not, we can. Uh, there's a button on it. There's a button on it. Oh, power. This, yes. All right. Well, since I have the mic anyway, I could be really brief. So yeah, I think this is a, a very good question, right? We should consider this. and. Um, one of the ways in which we propose people justify the alpha level is by using decision theory. So what is the cost of actually saying, well, we're making a, uh, we're saying there's something going on here when there's nothing, but also the opposite cost, given the possible outcomes and the investment that goes into data collection. So I think decision theory is not used a lot to make these choices, but I think there is some agreement that it's probably an optimal way if we figure out how to do it. And maybe this is a good move towards thinking about how to do this. And then that would sort of solve the, the, the issue, right? Yeah, so I have a slightly different perspective. So suppose you have a, you do your work and it's a, it yields a 0 0.049, right? Now, it's true that perhaps data collection was very costly and, and it was very difficult to get the data you got, but that doesn't make the evidence suddenly stronger. The evidence is still the evidence, and you're fooling yourself when you're saying, well, yeah, it's, it's 0.049, but it was so difficult to get the data, so now I can make really strong claims. No, you still have to be modest. Uh, I do think that we should move to 
to a situation where you could actually still publish those kinds of data. So I'm a big fan of the registered reports mm -hmm. where there's outcome independent publication. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's actually an additional benefit of the 0.005 uh, guideline that it will bring people towards those kinds of uh, setups more readily. Yeah, I think there are two separate issues here. One is what should the threshold be for making a strong claim, and the other is what should the threshold be for publication or saying um, that we should put the evidence out there rather than wait and collect more evidence. So for easy to collect data, there's no reason to publish something if it would be easy to collect more evidence and get to a conclusive set of results. But for hard to collect data, I think then a case can be made for publishing it even if it doesn't meet a threshold to make a strong claim. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to separate those two issues. 0.005, your alpha in this in our paper was an, a threshold for making a strong claim. It's completely separate from what should the threshold be for saying this is worthy of publication versus no, go back and collect more data, come back when you have something conclusive. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah, and the sort of rise of in certain social science fields of meta-analysis where folks are increasingly combining estimates across studies and, and seeing that as, as a normal part of research, which in economics till recently it wasn't, feeds into this. So to the extent that I and my own research team, it's too expensive to collect a study that's well-powered to the level I'd want for conclusive evidence, but I know in my field three or four studies will eventually come along and, and we'll think of the collection of those studies as sort of the body of evidence. That, that may be part of the, the story. Can I add something to that? Yeah. yeah, just one thing. So sometimes we have to do something, right? People are not always interested in making a, a claim how strong something is. But if you were the first study and you, you figured something out and based on your data, there seems to be something that we should be doing. Even though we're uncertain, but there has to be a choice that has to be made, then sometimes you have to make a choice. So the discussion is a lot about where to, uh, how, how strong a claim you can make. But sometimes people do research and they have to do something. Yeah, ideally, we wait until we have a lot of data, but sometimes that's a third thing. So it's not publication, it's making a statement. Sometimes you have to have an action. Right? Yeah. Okay, I wanted to uh, open it to the audience. I know there's actually some authors on, on either, either of these uh, papers as well as others with, with views on this in the room. Um, Don, actually, do you wanna start out, Don? Um, we should run a mic back to you. Is there a mic? Let me repeat it since there was no mic. And, and so Don's question was, we've talked about type one and type two errors. What are some of the costs of having a literature full of or with many type one errors? So I think that was point, you were pointing to Daniel, I guess, on that? Or to yeah. the whole panel, okay. Yeah, so I don't know because I didn't quantify it, but I know that some people would say that there's a lot of pretty mediocre research that just has these just significant levels. And I know some people who say, yeah, so what? Ignore it. There's a lot of crap out there. Don't worry about every crappy study that has, you know, that p-hack their way to an effect. And yeah, maybe sometimes 30 people spend five years on this topic. Yeah, that's a waste. But you have to quantify how big the waste is. And it depends a little bit on the kind of research that you do, how big the cost is of some people messing around in a field with, which is not going anywhere versus uh, the cost of missing out on a potentially useful strategy and if you are a field that has really good ideas that could benefit people then missing out on one of these ideas is maybe much more costly than having 30 people muck around uh, i don't know but that's the decision right that's the choice so here's one potential potentially very real cost which is let's say you're a grad student and you're submitting to a journal and the journal treats all p-values below 0.05 as equally strong evidence and so some people can get away with making really amazing, mind-blowing, counterintuitive claims, but with p-values of 0.04. And then some students hold themselves to a higher standard and say, no, I'm not going to believe it until I can get reliably get p-values below 0.01, say. But then I'm not going to be able to claim things that are as eye-catching and clickbaity and so on. And if the journal treats those all the same, it's not going to accept those less exciting but more robust papers. And it is going to accept the more the ones that are going to get more attention, but are less robust. So I think that's, it's a cost that drives out good research because probably the good research is gonna be less exciting. It's gonna lower your impact factor if you measure it just by citation counts and so on. So I think there is a real cost to not distinguishing between 
stuff that is more robust and stuff that's less. I mean, the, the yeah, I mean, that's probably true. I don't know. I mean, I recently looked at the studies by Daryl Bem about precognition. There are nine. One is 0 0.001, one is 0 0.006. I think he could have gotten it to, uh, the, and one is 0 0.009, which also sounds like it could have gone there. So then it would have been a three study paper about precognition. Yeah, I think people can still get it in. Uh, you know, it's a good point, but yeah. So background for people not, folks not in psychology, the Daryl Bem studies are studies of telepathy, sort of communication, precognition, pre being able to predict things, um, which are really the, some of the, the crisis in psychology, experimental psychology came after these studies were published because they were seen as, as um, prima facie absurd findings. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, yeah so I'd just like to add that uh, Whenever this proposal com comes up, of course, people start to talk about type one and type two errors. But I find it, um, I'm, I completely agree with Samin that it's, uh, I find it more intuitive to think in three categories instead of two, namely one where you have weak evidence, where things are unclear, and one where the evidence supports the null hypothesis or supports the alternative hypothesis. You have to move to a Bayesian framework, of course, but um, so I, I don't like to think in, types, in terms of these type 1 and type 2 errors, specifically because the proposal isn't about how things will proceed on average across all these experiments that you could do, but it's specifically concerned with p-values in a very narrow range, namely the range from 0.05 to 0.005. What should we do with those p-values? And our proposal, actually it's a very modest proposal, I thought it was written uh, ex with an extreme modesty, like let's just call those um, uh, suggestive, right, instead of su significant. That was really the only proposal and people got really upset about it, uh, which was, yeah, a little surprising to me how, how uh, strong a response that, that very uh, s small change in, in uh, just one, one word, a little different. I think some of the reaction to it is actually not necessarily people getting upset with 0 0.005, it's just getting upset with a threshold. And so a lot of the criticisms, which I think are very valid, I think there's a lot, you know, I encourage you to go and read all those, the, the, the criticisms of 0 0.005, because they include many really good criticisms of 0 0.05, right? Many of the things they argue against 0 0.005 are just as valid arguments against 0 0.05. Um, to, to add to this, I agree. I mean, there was a, I, I did a small poll on social media about what people would do because I was wondering, so there's been some discussion and then I said, so what are you gonna do? Um, justify your alpha, lower it to 0 0.005, abandon significance testing. And then someone else said, uh, well, wait until there is consensus. <laughs> now that's not gonna be a solution because there are three alternative approaches, uh, but what there is consensus about is indeed that the old way is not, so you cannot wait. You have to do something, right? I think that's a very important thing. The choice is not, let's wait until there's consensus because that's not a good thing, so. Yeah. Ed, did you have your hand up as well? Yeah. I can try to repeat your question for the camera if you wanna. Oh yeah, then we better get your mic. Get this, yeah. So this is a very interesting session, but I, I have to confess that in my world, we don't have point null hypotheses. We have interval hypotheses. We think uh, coefficients are so small, you can treat them as if they were zero. And if you're, you're, if you're treating your null hypothesis with your probability, your alpha probability, you're totally screwing up my world for it because I'm getting totally wrong error char characteristics for that interval. Um, so I, I don't look at p-values as a way of making decisions. I look at, at them as a way of summarizing the data evidence. I don't have a, a spike of mass at zero. I have a continuous distribution from, from our prior. And I'm, looking, I'm thinking about the shape of the likelihood function. And a low p-value means the likelihood function is, is concentrated on one side of zero. Uh, p, o, p over two is an approximation of the posterior probability of the opposite sign. So I take that small p-value as a, as a symptom of measurability not translating into decisions, that might come later. I mean, you gotta have a loss function, you have to be explicit about the prior before you jump into any decisions. 
But particularly if the decision is treating this thing as if it's so small that it can be uh, rounded off to zero, that's totally different from zero in terms of statistics of it. So I think that, I don't know about psychology, but in economics, we don't have any of these uh, uh, point null hypotheses. Um, and then I, I thought I'd give you an example. You're trying to estimate the rate of return of, to education at Berkeley. And uh, so I did a study, and I got a p-value of only 0.3. And you tell me that's terrible, but nobody has ever come close. 0.4 is the best you could do. So I think uh, 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 accuracy is a relative thing. And the, the things that should be studied or should be published are the things that are most accurate compared to the historical record. Secondly, um, we could have an uh, estimated uh, rate of return to education that is 1% with a standard of 1% and have a t-value exactly the same level if the rate of return is, 11, is 10% with a standard of 10%. If it's that second case, I want my kids and grandkids to go to Berkeley. But a 1% mean with a standard of 1% is not going to carry the day. I'm just telling you that <clears throat> before you start marketing p-values that are going to be used in each and every context, you've you got to recognize that the context has got to have an impact on actual decision making. And we're leading people in, in totally the wrong direction when you, um, <clears throat> when you endorse uh, any kind of a conventional p-value. And the good solution is the one I think that comes out of any Bayesian analysis, which is your p-value should be a decreasing function of sample size, like he has, but, but then you don't know what level it should be. That has to do with a complicated aspect of the prior. So it's hard to be a real Bayesian decision maker, but the message seems to me to be pretty accurate. Thanks. Let's grab that. Thanks, Ed. Um, yeah, I think go ahead if you want to comment yeah, on that. Yeah, so um, um, I agree, of course, with most of, the, with most of this, and I've advocated Bayesian procedures myself, so I actually got a lot of flack from my friends saying, like, what have you done? You're suddenly promoting a p-value. You've, you've never liked p-values, and now you're suddenly... So, uh, so again, I'm with Samin when uh, I feel we're faced with a choice between two, two evil worlds, but one is slightly less evil than the other one. And I, I also thought it, um, uh, it was interesting how you gave the Bayesian interpretation of the p-value, like the one-sided p-value as the area of the posterior to the one side of zero, uh, which is actually also in a blog post, uh, one of the series that I mentioned, we, uh, we go into that. And um, uh, I, would, I would say the base factors here are also based on a comparison against a point null, right? But I, excuse me? No, uh, an alternative with a, with a, with a, a so it's a spike and slab setup, basically. Um, but I would say, so John Chukey was already a fan of the Piri null, where you don't have a spike for your null hypothesis, but a distribution that's tightly centered around, around that null. And you can show that if you do a Bayesian analysis, unless your sample size grows really big, uh, you'll get very similar results. But I think it's based on the context. I think I can give you some examples from the field of psychology where you would actually uh, agree that the point null is plausible. Yeah, so I think there's a concern that if the p-value threshold changes and publication decisions are contingent on meeting this threshold, the published estimates in the literature may even be more extreme than they currently are. Um, so that's, that's an interesting point. Yep. Oh, very quick, yeah. I mean, uh, I agree. We make the same point in the paper. Of course, you can say it's not intended as a publication threshold. But yeah, so that, that's the same for 0 0.05, was also not intended as a publication threshold. I think the more important thing is we don't want a literature with only p-values below 0 0.005. We want a literature that looks like the real world, and that is a p-value distribution. So I would say that a very nice recommendation by these 72 authors would not have been make sure that all the p-values are low, 
but write a letter to editors and say, dear editors, if at the end of the year I plot all the p-values from your critical hypothesis in your published journal, and it doesn't look like a normal p-value distribution, you didn't do your job, right? That would be good. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think plot two ones, right? Plot the distribution for conclusions that claim to find an effect and plot the one for conclusions that claim to find no effect or conclude that there's no effect. And then they should look different. Do that for sure. Yeah, we, this is kind of my argument that we need to push on many different fronts. And one of the really important fronts is to tell journals that it's not ethical to make publication decisions on the basis of significance thresholds. And also that includes Many people use that argument to say we should publish marginally significant results and let people make claims off of that. I'm, uh, I have mixed feelings about that, but certainly when there's strong evidence for no effect or an effect very close to zero, that should be published as well. It kind of goes back to the three categories, right? Strong evidence for an effect, strong evidence for no effect, or inconclusive, and then make an argument for why we should publish it even though it's inconclusive. Yeah, so I think it's a great point, and I also uh, believe that publication bias is, is probably the, the more important problem, uh, right? We're talking about p-values now, but uh, the p for publication bias is the, that's the, uh, the, the, the bigger one. Um, for it, issues, and, and again, I, I think you could advocate for one or the other, but advocating for being power to a certain level feels like it doesn't run into the very good problem that was raised here. It's results blind, sort of gets us back to register reports and... Um, there's a hand up over here. I imagine you get this kind of question a lot, but it seems like you're trying to put a Band-Aid on a very big problem. Um, and the problem is that the incentives for people to do bad faith research and publish articles that they know don't reflect kind of the best practices uh, that they were taught in grad school, or maybe not taught in grad school. Um, those just don't exist. So if you think about who's successful in a lot of social science disciplines, a lot of those people are just really great storytellers. And they'll find a way to tell a story given any set of results, and they'll figure out how to frame it in the literature so that it looks significant. Um, and I don't think that adding one more hurdle for them is going to affect them that much. It might affect everyone else. So how do you change kind of the status system so that you reward honest, good faith research that might be boring or have kind of marginal findings, but or encourage research that's more cumulative so that there's a back and forth discourse with some kind of partial verification? Um, I feel like right now you're you're trying to slow down the best athletes. Um, and these people are going to, I think, keep succeeding at what they're doing. So. so so I think that one good solution is not to make this an individual sport, because then people are going to try to outrun other people. And that's why some of the things that Samin mentioned, like the uh, psych accelerator, uh, I, I like the previous word for it, like that was CERN for psychology. Uh, and I think that's great, you know, get uh, a thousand people together, determine what the important questions are, solve them, uh, be author 740 on a paper about it. Um, that would be a great way to uh, overcome these problems, I think. Yeah, I think also I wouldn't, I, I'm not as sure as you are that many of these bad practices are done in bad faith. And to the extent that some people are doing them not in bad faith, then these these changes will help. But I understand your cynicism. And, and even if it's a small proportion of people doing it in bad faith, they will continue to get ahead if they're willing to p-hack harder or and so on. And then I would go back to Daniel's suggestion of write letters to your editors. Tell them that the, if they don't change practices, if they don't allow for you know um, null results to be published, replications to be published, um, encourage pre-registration, encourage transparency, things like that, that it's going, it, that's what contributes to this unequal playing field and to being able to get ahead in, with practices that are not ideal. So I think, you, I think the, the burden is on the gatekeepers. They're the ones who need to change, and I don't want to put responsibility on people with less power, but I also think that often people with less power think they have no power, but actually I think you have more than you think. And, and societies and journals and 
um, they care what their members think and what their members want to see in the journal. So I would use that voice. Yeah, and I actually also don't think that most researchers act in bad faith in, in, in this context. I think um, they can easily fool themselves into thinking, look, I've passed this threshold. We all agreed this is the, th the threshold. And now that my research has passed this threshold, it is now an established finding that should be immune from all criticism. And if you think of it that way, and, and uh, whether we like it or not, this is, this is sort of the way it goes. If we, if, we, if we think of it this way, we're misleading ourselves. I don't know that it necessarily that there are bad intentions, but uh, people don't like uncertainty. And so they, the, the kind of black and white thinking, it tailors exactly to what people, how people want to think. That's, I, I think, also why it's so difficult to eradicate it. Why don't we take one more question? Sean? We can. Thanks, Ed. and thanks for a great panel. This has been really interesting and I think a conversation to continue. So uh, a comment and then a, a, a more direct question. My comment is that I think part of the difficulty, at least for me, and happy to write this up to my own thickness, is I sometimes am hearing four arguments being combined as one, and I think taking them in turn would be helpful. So what's the problem? Is it p-hacking? Is it publication bias? type one error rates, type two error rates, false discovery rates that we're trying to address. What is statistical significance, actually defining it? So this threshold we talk about, is it for publication? Is it for submitting a journal article? Is it for accepting a journal article? Is it, uh, I, I should believe this, I should act on this? I think all of those are being debated. Um, should we have such a threshold at all, regardless of what that is, is another debate point. And if we should, what should this threshold be? And so I think maybe in future Twitter battles, retorts, taking those in turn would be really helpful for me as someone who's an author on neither of these, but deeply interested in the conversation. And then my more pointed question is for EJ actually, but would be keen to get the responses, and it's more because of my uh, naivete with Bayesian statistics, but it seems like your specific argument or one of them for the P.005 threshold is based off of a base factor of three being an important threshold from your simulations. It seemed like that was a qualitative benchmark. So if you could, for my edification, justify or explain where that comes from. I mean, was that something decided like 0 .0, 0.05 in the past, and so we're using one arbitrary threshold to support a new one, or is there evidence behind it? And then secondly, of all the teams Shaq played for, why the Suns? Never seen that in a presentation as someone who grew up in LA. <laughs> Maybe this is a good chance for you guys to respond, but also some closing thoughts too as well to wrap up. Yeah, so uh, in, in order of importance, uh, the, uh, the picture from Shaq uh, is there because I, uh, I, Googled, I Googled for free pictures. So the good ones weren't free. Um, <laughs> And uh, then, uh, <laughs> right, the, uh, the base factor of three, now it is, it is true when I discussed the number three, uh, um, you are completely right. Uh, Harold Jeffries, who really was the one who promoted and developed base factors, came up with this list of thresholds that are just as arbitrary as uh, 0.05 and 0.01. Uh, nevertheless, the argument is not based on a base factor of three. The argument is based on the fact that a base factor of three isn't very compelling, right? That's what I tried to show with the pizza plot. And if you analyze uh, p-values that are near 0.05, you will find base factors near three and sometimes a little lower than that. So that indicates there's a problem. And the reason why we then proposed the 0.005 is because that actually corresponds to a base factor of around 16 to 20. So that is actually uh, much more compelling. So uh, that was the reason. And uh, with respect to those thresholds, I, 
I have mixed feelings about them, so that's why I also always like to present the pizza plot, because that gives you a, a continuous idea of what the evidence uh, really is. So, yeah, just as sort of my two <laughs> closing uh, thoughts, I would say. Um, the, the first is that there should be more than um, a, a p-value uh, that's important to, to judge the evidence in a study, right? So there's statistical evidence, but just a single value, doesn't matter how low it is, should never be good enough to uh, end up on the front page of the New York Times or whatever. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second is even, so there's a lot of agreement about some important things. I would say, just to add, that sometimes we can agree publication bias is, I think, the biggest problem indeed. Um, regardless of which approach you want to decide upon, I would say give this a try to justify the alpha level in your, new, in your next study. Just give this a try. I think that's going to be a very interesting exercise for yourself, that you realize how strongly you just were guided by some threshold you never thought about. And the moment you're forced to think about this, I think that's a very educational thing. So that would just be uh, my homework. So I'm going to take the approach they take on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, where at the end of the show, they ask the panelists to predict what's going to happen next. And uh, something you said, Ted, actually made me think of this, talking about meta-analysis. So what I think is going to happen next is people will show that across their three or four or five studies in their paper, they get below the 0 0.005 threshold. So even if their individual p-values are only suggestive or maybe even marginal, um, together, meta-analytically, they have strong evidence. And that's terrible, and we need to not go in that direction. Um, as much as I think meta-analysis conceptually is the right way to think about accumulation of evidence, when we don't have safeguards in place to make sure each individual result is accurate and valid, then combining them together just amplifies any bias that's in the individual studies. So rather than computing a meta-analytic effect and p-value associated with it and celebrating if that meta-analytic p-value is, is very, very small, I would say look at your distribution of p-values. And if you don't see a distribution that looks like it came from a non-null distribution, then it doesn't matter how small your meta-analytic p-value is. So if you have a 0 0.04, 0 0.03, 0 0.05, 0 0.06 combined together, you get a really small p-value. That doesn't matter because you wouldn't get those four p-values if you had a real effect hardly ever. So you should be worried about why you got those four p-values, and you should not be satisfied that you got a meta-analytic effect with a small p-value. That's what I think is going to happen next. I think internal meta-analysis and, and even regular meta-analysis that finds overall strong evidence um, is going to make people feel better, and we should not drink that, that pill. That's, that's a dangerous path to go down. Um, my other concluding remark is if we're going to pick a basketball player to use in these discussions, it really ought to be Tim Duncan, the big fundamental, because he actually was a psych major and published a psych paper. Mm -hmm. Wow. OK. Uh, and maybe a future BITS network member. We're going to reach out to him. <laughs> um, great. That was a really thought-provoking session. I'm sure we'll have a lot to discuss in the coffee break uh, for the next 15 minutes. And then at 3.30, we're going to come back for our panel on institutionalizing research transparency. So thanks to our panelists.
potential solutions are moving forward. So without further ado, we're going to quickly introduce each of the winners this year. We're selected by a panel of BIT staff and catalysts, and then lead a quick Q&A if you have any questions for any of the catalysts before we go into the reception and carry the conversation forward. So our first uh, prize recipient is Dr. Daniel Lachens, who's an assistant professor of psychology at Idaho University in Technology. He's an experimental psychologist whose work focuses on reward structures in science and applied statistics. His MOOC, Improving Your Statistical Inferences, has over 10,000 students enrolled, and he has given over 40 workshops on open science and improving research practices. He co-edited with Brian Nozick a 2014 special issue of Social Psychology with pre-registration, replication studies, and he has published extensively on meta-analysis, statistical methods, and research reproducibility. Uh, the, join me in congratulating Dr. Lockins if you come join us. PowerPoints by the end of it, yeah. Our next winner in the Leaders in Education is Dr. Samin Vizier, who's an Associate Professor of Psychology at UC Davis. She's the Director of the Personality and Self-Knowledge Laboratory at UC Davis, and she teaches courses on research methods, replicability, personality, and self-knowledge. She conducts meta-science examining how people interpret specific scientific findings and tracks trends in the methods and results of published studies in psychology over time. She's a senior editor at Collabora Psychology, editor-in-chief of Social, Psych Social Psychological and Personality Science, and co-founder and president of the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Vizier. and onto some folks you haven't seen yet tonight. Moving to our emerging researchers, our next prize recipient is Ms. Erica Baranski. She is a PhD student in personality psychology at UC Riverside. Her research focuses on the cross-cultural examination of situ situational experience, as well as the volitional personality change process. In the area of research transparency, she has conducted meta-scientific studies on ethical research practices, and the improvement for psychological science. She's been involved in the Many Labs 3 and 5 projects, the Reproducibility Project in Psychology, an Open Science Collaboration Project, and the Institutional Re-Engineering for Ethical Discourse in STEM. She's been an active Center for Open Science Ambassador, presenting on open science at various conferences and trainings across the US, and has co-authored a recent paper about the open science badges. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Baranski. Our next winner is Mr. Charles Abersole. He is a PhD candidate in social psychology at the University of Virginia. He studies research practices in meta-science, where he conducts crowdsourced investigations of factors that influence the replicability of past research. These include the Many Labs 3 and 5 projects, which we just heard about, as well as being involved in the creation of StudySwap, an online platform for researchers and labs to share resources like access to samples, not to date. I think that we got that correction earlier, right? It's not a dating website. It's for sharing samples and study participants, okay? Mr. Abersole has been involved in the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science and has given workshops on using transparent research practices. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Abersole. <laughs> Try not to have complete gender separation on stage. Oh, I didn't like <laughs> Our next prize winner is Mr. Ranjit Lal. He is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Government at Harvard University. His research interests are in the area of international political economy with the focus on international institutions, global governance, 
financial regulation, and quantitative methods. His interest in open science was inspired by the difficulties he personally encountered in acquiring data to replicate past studies. He has since replicated, and I think I'm reading this right, 35 studies and published findings in political analysis and comparative political studies. His research has been published in international organization, political analysis, comparative political studies, regulation and governance, and the review of the international political economy. Please join me in congratulating Mr. Lal. Our next winner is Dr. Joshua Polanin. He is a principal researcher in education, criminal justice, and research methodology at the American Institutes of Research. His recent work focuses on the use and reporting of meta-analytic statistical significance testing, and his substantive experience is in the intersection of education and criminal justice, serving as the principal investigator of a large-scale systematic review and meta-analysis on the longitudinal consequences of school violence with support from the National Institutes for Justice. His work has been featured in several journals such as the Review of Educational Research, the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, and Research Synthesis Methods. In addition to his research, he's also published and trained researchers on meta-analytic packages in R, and he earned his PhD in research methodology with a focus in quantitative methods at Loyola University Chicago. Please join me in graduating Dr. Polanin. So our next winner is Dr. Karthik Ram. He is a senior data scientist at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science and a co-founder of the R OpenSci project, which develops R packages that facilitate access to data repositories. He is also a senior principal investigator at Berkeley's Initiative for Global Change Biology, and his interests in reproducible research lie in its applicability to global change. Much of his recent work focuses on building tools, and services around open data and growing diverse data science communities. Please help me in congratulating Dr. Ram. shadow puppets, but it's only a few minutes longer. And our final winner that we'd like to congratulate tonight is Ms. Soazik Elise Wang Son. She is a PhD candidate in economics and governance at the United Nations University. Her research focuses on the application of microeconomic impact evaluation techniques to understand which interventions work better to increase women's empowerment, labor-saving technology adoption, and children's health and schooling in sub-Saharan Africa. As a BITS catalyst, she has led trainings on openness and transparency in Cameroon, South Africa, the UK, the Netherlands, and the US, with her efforts leading to the exposure and training of over 150 researchers in transparent and open social science. Please can help me in congratulating Ms. Wang Song. So we have about 15 minutes and this is very free flowing and open. I see previous winners in the audience today as well as those who might be interested in applying for the future or other activists in this space. So if you have any questions for the Catalysts about their previous experiences, thoughts going forward, the floor is yours. Kelsey.
So what, uh, anyone who wants to take it, what inspired you to get involved in research transparency in this, in this area? Uh, I'll take a shot at this. Um, I think about seven years ago, I was a postdoc uh, trying to start a big data project or getting involved in a project that had just started. And um, the idea was that a whole bunch of data had already been collected and processed and everything was ready to go. And in four months, we should have a paper out. But then uh, as I started working through the data, I could not uh, retrace the provenance of the data. And then I spent uh, 11 months recollecting and reprocessing all of the data. And so that's when I realized there was absolutely no workflow, uh, no best practices around reproducible data. And then that's what inspired me to start doing this with my own work. Uh, I started grad school um, five years ago, I guess. And it, that was the point where uh, things were kind of emerging, surfacing um, in some explicit ways, it seems. And so uh, I really, I got to kind of, I was introduced to this whole issue um, and, and everybody was surprised that, uh, that all of these things were coming out and it just seemed really, it, it's always seemed really, um, I don't know, that, that people should be doing, or researchers should be doing things the right way. And that was, that people were surprised that researchers weren't doing things the right way. And so that kind of, uh, made me want to know more about the issue and how to um, help push forward uh, the way that the right way to do it. And so some of that is meta science, and some of that is learning uh, as a researcher, emerging researcher, how to keep doing those those things correctly. Certainly resonates with my experience. Uh, aspirational goals of things being better as well as people not doing this be a pain in the butt for my own work and everything in between, so great. Any other questions for the group? We've got about 13 minutes left. <laughs> or is everyone thirsty? <laughs> and, and please introduce yourself so we know who's attending. And Examples for convincing the skeptics. I'll take a stab at that. Um, so I would say uh, the most likely person to benefit from the documentation and sharing of my research workflow uh, is typically me six months from now. Um, so research is a long and difficult process. You do analyses, you do more studies, you write it up, you go back to those analysis scripts, you can't remember what you did you know, six months, a year ago, you don't remember what you named all the variables. And, and I have found that in making my materials accessible to others, I'm really just making them accessible to myself in saving me a lot of time in the future. Um, something else I've noticed is by sharing things, especially sharing data, uh, that potentially helps me personally in terms of impact of research. People come along with new questions that they answer with my data that I never would have thought of, and then they cite me. Um, so for, for the skeptics, I, I would say, you know, ideals are great, but appealing to our self-interest is great too. In a lot of open science practices that I've done, I tend to see a, a pretty tangible positive effect just for me personally. So if, if for nothing else, do it for your, your own sanity and citation count in the future. Yeah, I, I certainly second the uh, six months later <laughs> uh, aspect. The, the one other thing I'd say is, so I, I work primarily in meta-analysis, and so I think your question is applicable there, um, <clears throat> not only to yourself six months later, but to future researchers six years later or 16 years later. Uh, one of the really fun things that I get to do <clears throat> when I do meta-analyses is um, we'll collect dissertations or, or master's theses, 
and <clears throat> some of these dissertations can be quite old or even just a few years old. And we'll sometimes contact the authors and say, um, you know, you're missing something, we like your data, or we just have this question for it. And they'll generally they'll shoot back an email like, oh, I didn't know anybody was reading <laughs> my dissertation. I didn't know he was reading this paper. Um, and um, they're often forthright about their results. But I think the, the point is that um, another potential audience is the meta analyst. And, and making it open and transparent will promote um, not only the sharing of data, but then also the use of it later on. And so it, that can be really impactful um, to yourself, but also to the, to the field in general. Yeah, yeah so I, this, this may um, sound a little self-serving, but I, I, my um, project was a, a large-scale replication and reanalysis exercise, and, uh, and I eventually was able to, to publish the findings. Um, actually, conducting the exercise was, was not easy. Um, I encountered several obstacles, uh, most notably getting the data in the first place. I, I, would, I would email uh, authors. I would often get a hostile response, no response. I would follow up. Uh, but eventually, I, I did get um, data sets of, of 35 of these studies that were, were published in two uh, prominent journals. And uh, I was able to replicate uh, the original results in each case. And then I reanalyzed them. And then when it came to actually publishing my results, um, again, it wasn't easy. Sometimes the, the, the paper would get sent to uh, authors of the studies I was replicating. You know, you can imagine what, what their response was. Um, but eventually it did happen. And I think this is sort of um, indicative of, of the general progress we're making. You know, editors were, I, I felt, uh, as I, um, uh, you know, as I carried on trying, editors became more and more open to, to publishing this, this kind of replication study. Um, and eventually it happened, so uh, there's sort of lies at the end of the tunnel. So um, I agree with ev everything everyone said, but there is one downside to practicing open science, which is if you share your data, your code, and your papers and everything else, it just leads to a lot more collaboration. People just want to give you grant money. People want to write you into papers, and it just creates a lot more work for you. <laughs> so I think ever since I started doing open science, I've just been contacted by funders. People wanted to use my data set and then add something else to it, or write me into grants, and then I just constantly am snowed in with work. Maybe so people hit you up on Twitter to write a paper together. <laughs> it just sounds awful. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Done? Top priority in open and transparent social science research. Any first, any of the respondents haven't responded yet? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think my prize is more related to the fact that I did a lot of trainings on research transparency in the African context. So I managed to train in Cameroon, which is in Central Africa, but also in South Africa. And I also managed to have, uh, during my trainings across the Europe or the US, uh, people also coming from other parts of Africa. So I can say I managed to cover almost all the different parts of Africa throughout the research transparency training that I provided. And one of the key feedback that always come in terms of how can we really change the rules and which kind of institution can we really target in order to really uh, make the change of transparency is that most of the African scholars believe that uh, it's very difficult for senior researcher, so their supervisor, to really embrace the open the openness and transparency world in such a case that they are mostly, they are get really getting used to the way they used to do their research, so the traditional rule of hygiene, your research papers, because in the, even in the specific case of Africa, it's even difficult for senior researchers to share their papers. So it's not even about sharing the data, but even sharing a paper that has been published, people are hiding it. So there's a culture of hygiene and also a culture where the, those senior researchers are not really uh, ready to read, to share the data and everything. So I think if there is a change, especially in the case of Africa, that we would like to see is that uh, training has also to be targeted to those senior institutions or senior researchers so they can also 
uh, understand the benefits of really being open of, for increasing the uh, credibility and validity of results that are purchased for evidence uh, policy making in the context of Africa. Continuing my theme of being selfish as a fifth year grad student, I'll say hiring uh, is the, the, the next important or the, the big important frontier on these things. I think there's been uh, a lot of gains uh, in this area in terms of getting changes in behaviors, getting researchers bought in. My experience has been that there's been a lot of enthusiasm for a lot of these practices, uh, especially at the junior levels of, of research and in our research community. I think a big struggle going forward will be managing retention of uh, people who are endorsing these practices and putting them into, into good use. Uh, if folks who are adopting these things are not staying within the research community or not staying active within these uh, fields, uh, we may lose a lot of the progress that we've gotten. I think grad students and junior faculty uh, folks are very sensitive to incentive structures, I think with good reason, um, and making sure that those incentive structures for the, the people we want to keep in our community reflect uh, these ideals and are trying to select on these ideals, I think will go a long way to long-term change by, by keeping folks in the field who, who are trying to make these changes and adopt them. So I'm guessing Don was expecting answers like pre-registration or replication or open data. But I want to echo both of these comments earlier. I think one of the really, really big problems that got us into this mess is uh, status and revering certain people and certain institutions and certain regions of the world and so on and assuming that those people can't do wrong or that once you have that status that, um, yeah, you're given a certain amount of privilege and, and benefit of the doubt. And I think that got us into a lot of mess. So I think everything we can do to evaluate work on its own merits, to not allow people to appeal to status in defending practices or findings or whatever. If we can get rid of that and make, I mean, ironically, I think a lot of this means getting this debate out in the open, making the debate itself transparent, because I think so much happens behind the scenes, so much of the pressure to, to kind of stop these reforms is happening using arguments that are only made in private and would not stand up in public. So I think bringing these arguments out in public, having as many open discussions and debates as possible, social media helps with this, but there, it needs to happen offline too, um, and not assuming that somebody's status is relevant to the strength of their argument in these debates or to the strength of their findings in science. Um, so one big change that I would like to see is moving away from seeing publications as the only scholarly output and recognizing that people produce a lot more. So these can include things like data sets, software, methods, implementation of methods, because it's very unfortunate to have uh, a paper that is not read or cited uh, count more than a piece of software that you wrote that is used by 200,000 people every month. And so uh, again, echoing that comment that we should sort of shift the conversation away from the way we've done things before uh, is sort of the key going forward. So one of, one of the experiments that I'm trying out right now is uh, a new journal that I helped create last year called the Journal of Open Source Software. And our biggest uh, goal is to become obsolete in less than five years because we are effectively publishing what looks like a, a, a publication describing the software so we can count that as a citation, but we shouldn't have to do that in order to get credit for research software. Same thing for data, and then you think of everything else that goes into the whole research process. Thank you, so interesting. Less about practices and more about culture and community change. Uh, I think we have time for one final question, if there's any burning thought out there. Please. Barrier setbacks and what facilitated your perseverance, your resilience? 
did you have anything? I said, sure. Okay. Or so, <laughs> so um, I, I do think it happens because uh, people are, are worried about, yeah, if you publish a replication, mention, people mentioned before, or just challenge the way that they've been working. Um, and, uh, but I think that many of the things that are being proposed just make so much intuitive sense uh, that you feel that they're the right thing to do. And uh, I think you can never really regret uh, doing, doing the right thing. Uh, even if you're a very young scholar, you might think, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it in science. I don't think anybody really regrets doing the right thing and then not making it in science. Uh, if you look back, then uh, you did the right thing. So you should be, uh, uh, yeah, sort of uh, happy with that at the very least. So that sort of commitment, focusing on that, that's sort of what I uh, try to do. And I think if I would have been out of science, which should you know, could have been possible, then I, I wouldn't have regretted any of these choices in any case, because they're just the right thing to do. Um, uh, so I'm a smart grant recipient as well, and um, we finished our uh, paper and we tried, we submitted it to a journal. And I apologize if one of the reviewers is in here because I'm about to call you out. Uh, and our paper's on, uh, we're, I'm gonna talk about it tomorrow, but it's on data sharing for meta-analysis. And the very first comment was, oh, this is an interesting paper, but it would have been great two to four years ago because I feel like the culture has changed now where everybody just shares their data. And um, I like just immediately like closed the review and was like, okay, I'm just done with this journal for now um and so i would say if there's a negative experience it would be <laughs> peer reviewers not being receptive to uh to my to data sharing in general uh but in all seriousness i think that there is a uh one of the things that we learned that i'll talk about tomorrow and uh, we did a survey um asking people about their data sharing habits and and how they felt about sharing data and there's a lot of concern uh, rightly about um, how data will be used and who will use it in the future and uh, will they still get credit for all this hard work that they've gone into it. Um, and I think there's a lot of, and, or, and not to mention institutional review boards and funders, what do they do with it? So I think there's a lot of practical concerns and constraints um, that we still need to figure out as a community and how to uh, conduct this one small aspect of transparency data sharing that I'm interested in. Um, but there's still, so there's still challenges to overcome. So it's not necessarily negative, but there's still definitely issues to, to figure out. Uh, one of the challenges that um, Charlie kind of touched on earlier uh, that's relevant for psychology at least is uh, when you're a grad student and you are focused on uh, meta science and um, replication attempts, there's pushback in whether or not that counts as sort of uh, part of your um, your substantive research or uh, your um, not service. <laughs> and uh, so pushing back against that is packaging yourself as uh, a meta scientist um, in addition to whatever field of interest you're in and not necessarily as somebody that does re uh, replications, but um, trying to instill in uh, whoever you're trying to instill something in. Uh, that uh, meta science is science, and uh, it's just a matter of uh, the unit of analysis, um, and it shouldn't necessarily be considered part of your service section of your CV. Um, and then that will legitimize the <laughs> half of your research <laughs> package. Yeah, I, I, when I did my um, replication study, I, as I mentioned before, I got some hostile responses from authors when I would request data. Um, when the study came out, um, I mean, I, apparently I got some abuse on online forums and things like that. I'm, I'm told I didn't actually look at them. And you know, I was I was um, on the job market at the time as well, and people would tell me you did a brave thing. The euphemism would be brave. You know, you're very brave in doing this. Um, but I think overwhelmingly, it's you know, people you know, have been encouraging and have said. Yeah, I mean, it's um, yeah, it was a brave thing to do, but someone, I mean, we all acknowledged that there was this big problem in the field, and I was focused specifically on missing data um, and, and techniques for handling missing data. And um, I think many people, many people have generously said that this is a, this is a service to the field, and 
um, and the discipline more broadly, uh, and that's great encouragement. You know, throughout the project, um, I would receive encouragement each stage from my advisors, from other people. Um, and so I would say overall, the, the positives definitely outweigh the negatives, but um, there were a lot of sort of uh, roadblocks along the way. Yeah, I think a lot of people I know, and myself included, have experienced a lot of um, negative consequences. But I would say that organizations like BITS and, and uh, social media, and especially early career people who are, you know, are joining the discussion and making really good points. I think that outweighs by far all the negative things in the comments sections. And yeah, don't read the comments. <laughs> I think there is a lot, a, a really, really big and vibrant community that appreciates uh, honest discussion and criticism and so on. Um, not and and will support people who work for that. Not in a knee jerk kind of way. Not unconditionally, but just you know, in a balanced way. So I think there is resistance and there is a lot of. Um, yeah, pushback, and that can be disheartening, but I think that there's also a lot of appreciation out there for this kind of work, and so I would keep that in mind too, although the setbacks are, are hard sometimes. So one thing I'd say in this, in this topic is that a lot of the pushback that everybody talked about was something that we experienced a, a few years ago. So there's a lot of culture change that I've seen happen and just the last five to six years, and it was much, much stronger than it is now. So now when you talk, again, it's all context dependent and field dependent, but for example, like my PhD advisor in 2008 was very upset that I was using open source software and he could not trust the outcome. And he promised me one day that if I just use proprietary software, he would pay for a license for it for the rest of my life. And um, to this day, he, uh, not to this day, but like about once a week I get an email from him saying, do you know you could do this with open source software? This is really cool. <laughs> and he's the editor in chief of a major journal who was just very annoyed with people wasting time sharing code, sharing data, and now constantly talks to me about how do we implement a new data sharing policy. And I've seen that with many mentors over the past who just complained and said this is just a waste of time to my lab does this now, what do you think? And so I, I, it's changed quite a bit but there's still a long way to go. Great, well, I think that's a great uh, question to end on. Uh, with all of the pushback, challenges, and whatnot you've all faced in doing the work you do, thank you for persevering, for your resilience, for being a model for others, an inspiration. And while we might have different ideas on how to get there, know that you have this community, and not just you up here, but everyone here has this community of those who are interested in the pursuit of transparency and openness. So thank you very much. And uh, we hope this is a catalyst for you to continue this work going forward. So thank you. So a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're back here tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. for coffee and registration. The formal program starts at 9. I can say that I'm really excited about everything from start to finish, from system science methods to understand this whole issue at the start of the day to figuring out how to create transparency in policy analysis and modeling at the end of the day. So we hope if you're available that you stick around for the full program tomorrow. Now we have the reception. We hope you keep the conversation going while we have this space and enjoying the rest of the night where Berkeley has to offer. So thanks very much, and I'll see you at the bar.